Thank you very much, President Woodrow. It is a great honor for me to be here. I had hoped to be able to be here in person, but we had a slight interruption with the pandemic going on. And uh, I welcome the chance to share with you some of my experiences, which I hope will be inspirational and will guide you during the difficult times now and in the future. I think I recall when I was graduated in 1940. That's the class of 1940. That was 80 years ago, and I'm still here. And uh, it gives me a rare opportunity to share with you what happened to me during those 80 years, which may have some relevance to what may happen to you in your future. I was born in the most humble of all circumstances. The country in which I was born, Transylvania, no longer exists. My father had been trained as an apprentice, as a shoemaker, and uh, there were no jobs for him in Romania or Hungary. And uh, they decided we'll go to the land of promise. And so we sailed in December 1921, I guess it was. We're welcomed by the Statue of Liberty. We arrived with no money, no language, no friends, two little kids. Fortunately, a man who owned a few apartment houses offered my father a job to be the janitor of those houses in exchange for which we could sleep in the cellar in Hell's Kitchen, New York. It was called Hell's Kitchen because it was hell <laughs> more than kitchen. So I started my uh, career there, but because we couldn't pay the rent, we often had to move and we moved to the Bronx. And in the Bronx, I reached the eighth grade where Mrs. Connolly was my teacher. And uh, uh, the, the principal was uh, Mr. Stanton. And one day, my teacher, Mrs. Connolly, said, I should bring my parents in. They want to talk to them. I thought they had caught me doing something. I was usually up to some kind of mischief. They said, uh, you uh, have a gifted boy. So we looked at each other, and I never got any gifts. She never got any gifts. I didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, they said he should go to college. Well, that was my first introduction to City College. And um, I went to City College, and uh, the first thing I learned there was that you have to study. And the reason I learned that is because I flunked, flunked the first two courses. One was in French and the other one was in algebra. I didn't see why I should know French, how I didn't know any Frenchmen. I didn't see why I should study algebra. And uh, the results was, if you don't study, you don't advance. Very important lesson number one for students going out to the world. If you want to make progress, you better know your stuff first. I had decided, since I had known a lot of criminals and I didn't know any lawyers, People kept saying, as my uncle said to me, he'd make a good lawyer or he'd make a good crook, crook. And I didn't want to be a crook. What's the best law school in the world? And they said, Harvard. And I said, okay, I'll apply for Harvard. I didn't know Harvard from Brooklyn. And uh, I applied and I was accepted. Uh, it must have been something in my background that attracted them. But on the exam on criminal law, um, they gave me a full scholarship <laughs> because apparently it did very well on that one. While I was still in law school, the war broke out. I enlisted in the army and uh, managed in due course to land on the beaches of Normandy to go through the Maginot Line and the Siegfried Line to uh, cross the Rhine. Uh, river on a pontoon bridge, driving a jeep. As a result of that, uh, I was told to report to the judge advocate section. The colonel there said, we have information from Washington that we are to set up a war crimes branch. What's a war crime? And um, they said, your name has been forwarded from Washington. And uh, so I think I was the first man in the U.S. Army to deal with war crimes.
From there, I went as a liberator of many of the concentration camps we were running into. And uh, there I saw the horrors, which are almost indescribable and also incredible in the normal, rational mind. It made an indelible impression on me. I saw the victims looking like skeletons piled up bones in front of the crematoria waiting to be burned. I saw the vengeance when some of the inmates, there were a few such cases, grabbed the SS guards and killed them. And I came to the conclusion that if there was anything important I could do in my life, it would be to stop war making. War can make murderers out of otherwise decent people. And I saw it happening. And uh, when we set up the war crimes trials after the war, I was appointed the chief prosecutor and the evidence was shocking. Daily reports from the front of special extermination squads known as Einsatzgruppen. It's a German name, means action groups. Their assignment was to kill without pity or remorse every single Jewish man, woman, and child they could catch. It was, no doubt, the biggest murder trial in history. It was my first case. I was 27 years old. I had never been in a courtroom before. I had never tried a case before. But with that evidence, I tried the 22 highest ranking defendants I could find, the best educated. I had lawyers, I had preachers, I had all kinds. Put them on trial, charged them with genocide, which was the first time that word had been mentioned in a legal trial because it had not been authorized by any of the statutes and uh, crimes against humanity. I remember it very vividly and it has influenced my life in many ways. The opening sentence was, you may please your honors, it is with sorrow and with hope that we here disclose the murder of a million innocent and defenseless men, women and children. Sorrow and hope. Sorrow for the victims who had been killed. Hope that we could prevent it from happening again. That was the framework in which I cast the whole trial. That opening sentence, uh, which was 60 years ago now, uh, has guided me. Vengeance is not our goal, nor do we seek merely a just retribution. We ask this court to affirm by international penal action man's right to live in peace and dignity, regardless of his race or creed. The case we present is a plea of humanity to law. That is particularly appropriate today. The right of all human beings to live in peace and justice regardless of their race or creed or color. Uh, that goal has never been completely accepted in any part of the world. And as we see it today, uh, with the riots take place in New York and in other parts of the country as I speak, because uh, one man, George Floyd, uh, was killed uh, by a police officer in the course of taking an or making an arrest. And the country is up in flames again. Every city in the Union now says riots in the streets. So it's particularly appropriate that uh, I mention that at this time. And uh, it has not reached the scale of the Nazi design to kill all the Jews, but uh, the Black people have been discriminated against in the United States ever since before the Civil War. These are uh, the things which are troubling today and which will continue to trouble you as you come out. And all I can urge you to do is uh, remember this is a little boy coming from Transylvania in a house which had no running water, no electric light, toilets outside in the hall. Couldn't be lower than that. Uh, discriminated against also as a Jew, where he came from, and uh, also thereafter. And we have tried uh, to instill a sense of 
decency in everyone else. My goal since that time, since the time of the Nuremberg trials, has been to try to bring about a change in heart and mind, because that's what you need in order to change the way people behave. We have to stop glorifying war making, regardless of the cause. Uh, war making will kill innocent people, no matter what. And it shouldn't be an accepted procedure in a civilized society. And uh, in order to do that, they say, how do you do that? My slogan is law, not war. Uh, everybody likes the slogan. That's a clear slogan, law, not war. If you have a dispute, you go to a court and settle it. And we have set up, and I had a very active role in that, an international criminal court to hold people accountable for genocide, for crimes against humanity and war crimes. Uh, so the mechanisms are just beginning to be created. And it'll be up to you to improve them as we go. Until you can change the hearts and minds, you can change the actions. So how do you get people to accept, compromise, compassion, human rights as mandates? That's the challenge that you face. We are all inhabitants of one small planet and we have to share the resources on that planet so that everyone can live in peace and human dignity. That, my dear friends, I pass that burden on to you. I have done as much as I could during one lifetime. I'm still alive, as you might have noticed. Uh, and uh, good luck to all of you. You've got a good education at City College. I'm sure of that because I had a good education there too. Use your education for the benefit of all mankind. And you'll have my blessing as well. Good luck to you all.